Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 1206.3 Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. This week, week 11, we go beyond the statutory interpretation component and we start to deal with the issues of drafting in practice as a lawyer. The material this week and next week is essentially non-assessable other than for participation. If you have any questions about the content generally um, or this week's material, please let me know. And for those of you watching this as a recorded session, please ask any questions, preferably through UCRU. If not, uh, feel free to send me an email. Now, this week, the study guide is both informative and entertaining. If you haven't yet had an opportunity to read it, I commend it to you. The purpose of this week is to consider legal communications, particularly correspondence and affidavit material. There are ways of drafting material that is sound in terms of practice and also in terms of the way in which material is conveyed. And the idea is to be effective as a communicator. The preparation of an affidavit is particularly important because you're communicating almost through the, through the, the client who, for who you're preparing the affidavit directly to the court. So in many instances, the affidavit that you prepare takes the place of the examination in chief. And those of you that have um, done civil procedure or perhaps evidence and proof will, will better understand what's involved in the provision of evidence in chief in, um, in the evidence form. So, so affidavit, as opposed to statutory declarations, is specifically intended to be filed in court proceedings, whereas a statutory declaration, although it is also under oath, is of far more general use. We don't usually file a statutory declaration in court proceedings. Invariably, we will be filing an affidavit. Now, of course, when you prepare an affidavit, you have ethical obligations to consider, both towards your client and, very importantly, to the court. So please consider those when you're drafting any material. So this week, next week, we talk about specific drafting techniques at an advanced level. But here's the, here's the um, interesting part about the advanced level of drafting, and that is that in many ways, the more simple that you can draft the material, the more advanced your drafting skills in fact are. So those of you that have worked with me in the past, particularly say an introduction to law, will know that one of the first things that I attempt to do is to have you simplify your language, almost invariably shorten the sentences that you use and write in the active voice. Now, I'll say all those things again and, and mean it, but now that we're at the advanced drafting stage, I can let you in on a little secret. And that is that I have no problem with longer sentences. Generally, if you have a sentence more than say 25 words, you need to review it carefully um, and give consideration to shortening it. But a longer sentence can be very effective, particularly if done in conjunction with some shorter sentences. Uh, for example, um, I'll read something from an excellent publication, and I will refer back to this publication later. This is Modern Legal Drafting, A Guide to Using Clearer Language by Peter Butt. It's from Cambridge Press. An excellent text. Um, if you want to learn more about drafting techniques, I commend this book to you. Anyway, chapter six starts this way. Wordiness is the legal profession's most recognisable trait. Redundancy, its chief characteristic. Lawyers really do go on. Their motto might be, never use one word where you can use two, and the more you use, the better. Very apt and very well written. And you note that um, um, Peter Butt, in his commentary there, used different size or different length sentences to convey the meaning. So um, whilst I do advocate, generally speaking, the use of short sentences in the active voice, be prepared as you become more skilled to throw in some longer sentences, perhaps a semicolon might help you in that regard, 
and then break up the flow. So as Peter Butt did there, a longer sentence followed by a very short, snappy sentence works well. Anyway, that, enough Thanks, of that. Sir. Yes, Greg, how are you? I'm very well. Hi, Neil. Um, I was reading an article overnight that Justice McHugh wrote, and I find consistently his ability to describe a particular situation, say in reference to constitutional law, very clear, very um, apt, very um, particular, and it's just an absolute breeze with his way of expression. And he does have short sentences with clear words. He's probably the best exponent that I realise that I've, I've read so far. That's a great commendation, Greg, and um, I totally agree. It's very frustrating when you're trying uh, very hard to understand something and it's written in a style that makes it very difficult to do so. So that's great. Thank you. I'll look out for more um, intently for judgments of uh, Justice McHugh. In the reference material, there is um, a material from Declan McGrath, which I commend to you. And from a very practical perspective, if you want to look at how these skills that we have for this evening um, are used in practice, have a look at the Family Court of Australia fact sheet preparing an affidavit or the Federal Circuit Court of Australia. Um, so it goes into specific detail about how to prepare an affidavit. And also Legal Aid Queensland has some um, useful precedent material, which I think is generally available to the public, for example, about preparing an affidavit for an application for a restricted license or a work license, things like that. So that's a very good practical way of seeing how lawyers will prepare affidavits in practice. So of course, as we mentioned, an affidavit is a sworn statement. It is used as, as it were, in place of evidence in chief or to supplement evidence in chief. And it's used in the um, litigation uh, proceedings as opposed to statutory declarations. Have a look also at some of the other key terms. Bona fide means in good faith. Extra cur curial means out of court. Salutation is the opening, normally dear sir, but there are some variations. Signposting, something that I encourage you to use as part of your drafting technique, is the use of headings or subheadings as you progress. And uh, hi, Siobhan, thanks for joining us. Unrepresented litigant, of course, someone who's not represented by a lawyer in court and without prejudice material. So we've been talking about, so far, drafting techniques generally and specifically more in terms of affidavit material. One thing that um, is not included in your notes that is very important from a practical perspective is your ability to take a detailed statement from a client. Now, that may well be the content ultimately of your affidavit material, but it's always a good starting point. So rather than initially taking an affidavit, um, why not take a detailed statement? Then you can transpose information. The statement can be much broader than an affidavit because given that an affidavit is intended to be used in place of evidence in chief, all of the evidentiary rules about relevance um, and admissibility apply to the affidavit. Now, they don't apply to a statement. The statement is really something where you're asking the client very specifically to tell you about the facts and the circumstances, um, whether they're evidential circumstances or not, about the matter that you're involved in. So the statement can be very broad, and from that material, you can draw your affidavit selectively. The um, the fact is that many lawyers just don't do, don't prepare detailed statements. It's very important from a practical perspective, because think of it this way. If you're acting for a client in any form of litigation and you choose not to obtain a detailed statement or draft a detailed statement from the client from the outset, you run a very real risk. The risk might be that at the end of the matter or during the trial or at the end of the matter as you're leading up to trial, the client tells you something um, and even might suggest, well, I've already told you that before, even though you know they haven't. So the idea of a statement is that you have a full understanding of all of the relevant material, 
that the client wishes to convey to you and possibly to the court or the other side relevant to a matter. The other practical aspect of that is that um, you'll do a better job in front of a court, you won't be embarrassed in front of a court and importantly you won't appear before the Legal Services Commission um, and you've taken the precaution of ensuring that all the material relevant to a case is with you. All right, so now when it comes to writing letters, there's been a dramatic change in my time. And of course, that's with the advent of initially facsimile machines. And um, I'm old enough to, I may have told you this, but uh, old enough to know when the first facsimile machine came into the law office where I was working, and we were amazed. We would stand around this fax machine and watch it and think, that's magic. How did that happen? Then, of course, we've um, progressed to emails and other forms of um, electronic communication. But the basic rules about writing letters remains the same. And you should always treat writing an email as if you're writing a more formal letter. In fact, it is just as formal um, in many ways. Possibly the salutation, but Treat it at telexes, says Greg. Yes, I remember telex as well. Um, and Gestetner machines. We didn't have photocopiers when I started. We used Gestetner machines. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, so when you're writing letters, emails be very careful. And emails um, are a trap, particularly if someone is emotive, particularly angry or upset. Be very careful about sending an email in that state. It may come back to haunt you. Also, of course, think about who the recipient or oh, and be very careful about email trails. Such a dangerous thing to send an email off from a, a, an email trail. Think about the recipient. Um, think about the person who is receiving your communication. Tailor your communication to that level. Still make it clear, still use short sentences, but the clarity and the simplicity may come about as a result of your ability to use relatively complex legal language or um, terminology, which saves you time if the person that you're conveying the material to understands what you're talking about. Think about what is your objective. So often I see this in exam, you know, an assessment material, and I, I do mark a lot of assessments, as you might expect. And um, what I'm looking for, amongst other things, is whether you can convey a clear objective and understanding to me and so often I'm reading material thinking where is this going whereas it's pretty easy just tell me from the start like for example when I'm doing advocacy work in court um, for example if it's criminal law matter I will often say from the outset this is ultimately my submission that imprisonment is warranted in the circumstances but your honor might consider framing the sentence so that the defendant does not serve any actual time of that imprisonment. You know, do that at the start. They know then where you're going and what you're trying to achieve. When you're preparing your written communication, think about what is your objective and importantly, what do you want to happen next? And this is well il illustrated in the study guide. You don't always put every piece of information into a letter. You may hold some material back, but be careful about that. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason that lawyers do that is so that uh, they're not giving something away. Now, of course, what that means is that the advent of ADR practice mediation, where the parties in a protected environment are encouraged not to hold things back, means that we've got a better chance, more realistic chance of settling disputes. Now, think about the status of the correspondence. If you've done civil procedure, you'll know all about without prejudice material. You'll know about without prejudice communications, privileged communications, legal professional privilege, and you'll know about colder bank offers. So colder bank offer is where it's um, a, a document is headed without prejudice, save as to costs. So you're looking to preserve a costs position specifically. As the notes correctly point out, just because you say something in a correspondence is without prejudice does not automatically make it without prejudice. It needs to be a communication within the context of a genuine desire to resolve an outstanding dispute or issue. 
So just saying without prejudice is not, does not give you then a license to, for example, defame someone. Likewise, conversely, even though something is, does not specifically say it's without prejudice, does not mean that it, it um, is not privileged. If it is genuine attempt to resolve issues, then the courts will imply the words without prejudice. But don't be comforted by that. Always put without prejudice if you mean it to be without prejudice. Now, are there any questions in relation to anything that we've discussed so far? When I say we've discussed, mostly me talking. Any questions, comments, observations? All good? All right. So in your notes, the recommendation, and I agree with this, what is the correct tone? So we've talked about the content. We've talked about the level. We've talked about the way in which it's, um, the letter is structured. What is the tone? Strength with courtesy is a good way of putting it. So you want to convey an indication of strength, but at the same time be courteous, never disrespectful. Again, think about your legal obligations, your ethical obligations, um, and everything that you write. The test that I adopt, and I think you should adopt, is would I be comfortable if this matter was before the Legal Services Commission, or would I be comfortable if this was a matter was being read by a Supreme Court judge? That type of test will serve you well. Listen to the inner voice. Now, when we talk about strength with courtesy, um, bear in mind that uh, we're talking about um, having some degree of um, reservation, possibly, in the material that you're, you're um, sending, as opposed to a full disclosure, which uh, may be done through without prejudice, or it might be done through a mediation session. Or, of course, it may be required for the course of uh, providing full evidence in your affidavit uh, material. All right, so affidavits are under oath. When you prepare an affidavit, remind the client um, that you are preparing something which is effectively examination in chief. Therefore, what you put in the material must be relevant. It must have a, a logical probative effect or probability of affecting something in issue. It must be admissible, so you don't, with very few exceptions, include material that say hearsay. It must be reliable and it must have some degree of probative value. So the same rules that apply to the provision of evidence in chief apply to the drafting of aff affidavits. So it's an affidavit is evidence, it's factual based, it's not a statement of claim, it's not a written submission, it's not some sort of written argument presented to a court, and it's not a statement, which is generally far broader. An affidavit has a specific purpose. And to draft the affidavit correctly, you need to have a logical flow. Always use signposts and headings, unless it's very short, and make sure that the reader can start the document with little to no prior knowledge of the material, but still have it make some sense. Now, if you're putting in a, a fourth affidavit in a relation or matter, you might refer back to earlier affidavits, but leaving that aside, it must be something that is understandable. So don't assume that the writer, the reader will have read other material, for example, when preparing an affidavit. It needs to be direct, but it needs to be as much as possible self-contained. You don't include legal argument in an affidavit, and um, it's something that um, is factually based. It is sworn testimony, so good practice always if you prepare an affidavit and or a statutory declaration when the person signing the document is about to sign. This would be the case in an affidavit anyway. If they're swearing on oath under using a Bible, then literally have a Bible there um, and make sure that the person who is witnessing uh, is a, a, a lawyer or a JP or a commissioner for declarations, someone who is appropriately accredited to witness an affidavit. 
All right. Um, and of course, make sure that um, any exhibit markings are correctly annexed to the affidavit before it's signed. Any questions? All good? I'll keep going. All right. So once you've prepared your affidavit, um, it's always a good idea if you have the time to have someone read it. It's amazing how often you write something and no matter how many times you read it carefully, you just don't pick up on a basic error, which might be apparent to someone who reads it with fresh eyes. Another thing you can do is put it through a word to text, sorry, a text to word program so that you can hear the audio of what it is that you've written. That is if you've got some time and it's amazing how using your ears in that circumstance may pick up on something that you didn't notice with your eyes. You've got to be careful when you're preparing an affidavit about coaching and that is you can't tell people what to put in the affidavit by way of a statement of fact. It's got to be them but by the same token you're entitled to encourage them to ensure their affidavit is comprehensive. In other words if you were dealing with a family law issue of property and in your affidavit material you spoke about issues surrounding the acquisition of real estate, but you said nothing about the um, uh, process of buying a business and running a business, then it's really incomplete affidavit. So there's nothing wrong with you saying, you've got to tell me something about the business now so that we're providing complete and full uh, evidence for the jurisdiction um, that you're in at that time. So drafting affidavit is something that um, you need to consider carefully. It comes with practice. I, as a, from a practical perspective, um, not that I draft many affidavits now, but when I was a solicitor drafting lots and lots of statements, lots and lots of affidavits, I would generally use my voice and to some degree I would engage in an interview process with the client. Um, it was effective in the sense that I could then control the flow of the material. Let's talk, now let's talk about the house. So when did you buy the house? I'll get an answer and then I'll summarize that, but using as much as I can, the words that were used by the um, person for, who was ultimately going to sign the affidavit and record that into the, uh, using voice recognition into the affidavit material. So it takes a little bit of, coordination with your client to do that but it's a very effective way of doing it. Um, having said that quite often most of the time I'd prepare a statement from the client first as I mentioned at the start. Hey John yes, it's Greg, Greg again. Mm -hmm. Yes Greg. Uh, a quick point on that um, when we do a resumption of a person's property I'm very surprised about the fact that officer statements are not taken by our legal party, um, our legal representatives, because um, it almost is as if it's left then to, if it goes to the court, the land court in this case, that the land court hears only from the expert and also um, whatever the particular solicitor or barrister is that is engaged. Um, and even though the state of Queensland is representative as a party, um, it's, I, I can't remember an instance, certainly in a resumption case, where a, a statement has occurred. I have seen it, obviously, where they get in the witness box, uh, state valuation service valuers for um, ratings purposes for, for matters like that. But is that your general impression of things like that? Well, yeah, I, I can't comment upon the, upon the specifics, but yes, I think generally there's um, not enough material is collected on the run and um, in a useful form. So if, if that's what you're getting at, Greg, yeah. But I, ca I can't comment about specifics in the land court on, on the resumption, sorry. It, it, the reason I mention it, John, is that quite often the officers get a different perspective that never gets brought up in the court that may be may or may not be useful to the court that that's probably where i was going with that that's yeah what. sure so that there's not the full appropriate evidence necessarily provided for the court yeah, to make that's a, a full decision 
Okay, no, that's fine. Yes. Yep, great. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so when you're preparing your affidavits, make sure that uh, you consider the signposting, make it logical, use um, short sentences, make sure that you draft the affidavit in the first voice so that you it is I did this, I did that, not the um, second or third voice, um, and make sure that it's objective and it deals with facts. Now, before I wrap up this evening, and I promised a short session, so it will be a short session, I'm just going to come back to Peter Butt's publication. And in the context of jargon and simplified language, there was a parcel of um, commentary that really caught my attention. And um, it was this. Um, it makes the comment that allied to legalese is jargon, which means we use legal language to, as part of the profession. Um, but lawyer's jargon has been a ready source of parody. As far back as 1835, Arthur Simons caricatured the jargon of conveyancing documents using as his example, the gift of an orange. And what Mr. Simon said was, what I don't understand about lawyers is why they seemingly want to complicate something that is otherwise very simple. For example, if I want to make an effective gift of an orange, why can't I just say, I give you my orange and write that, I give you my orange. But lawyers, I don't know why, seem to want to add words. For example, it may seem more loyally, if that's a word, to say, I hereby give you my orange. What does that add? Adds nothing at all. But it makes it look more impressive, perhaps. But then lawyers want to go beyond that again and say something like this. I hereby convey to you my orange and all my right title and interest in it. <laughs> what does that say? It really doesn't say anything. But he goes on to say, that might be insufficient to denote transfer of complete ownership. So, so that we're crystal clear on this, how about we say, I hereby convey, convey to you my orange and all my right title and interest in my said orange together with the right to enjoy my said orange as fully as I can enjoy the same. You can see the bizarre nature. And then finally, the full blown version of what should really be simple is, I hereby give to you all and singular, my estate and interest, right title, claim and advantage of and in my orange with all its rind, skin, juice, pulp and pips, with all rights and advantages therein, with full power to bite, cut, suck, or otherwise eat the same, or go, give away, etc., etc., and it goes on. So part of your task, of course, is to write in that simple manner from the outset, and the secondary task is to reduce that which is overly complex and meaningless and strip it back to, um, to the, simple, um, conveying, uh, the simple use of uh, language and message. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Are there any questions before I wrap up? All good. And I hope that you're making good headway in your second assessment and really appreciate you being here tonight. So thank you, Neil. Thank you, Gregory. Siobhan's gone, but she was here as well. So thank you. All the best. And we'll see you next week. Bye.